Welcome to Hope Community Church podcast, episode number one. This is a first part series and a series we're going to be doing on the power of the cross. It's Easter time. People are going to be celebrating the resurrection of Christ. And uh, so we're going to be talking about what the, the, the today's episode is going to be the relevance of the cross. So I hope you stick around and join us for the whole podcast. So I'm here with our team here in our live studio at the Hope Community Church in Montgomery, and uh, we're going to be discussing this uh, a little bit further. I wrote a book called The Crux of the Matter. You're welcome to buy that online. You'd be blessed to do so, and I would be too, so I encourage you to do that. But we're going to talk about first, we're going to go, again, we're going to talk about the relevance of the cross and what does that mean for us, you know. So Jesus talks about this. He talks. He had a message that he preached in John chapter 6. And it was not a very popular message. It was it was terrible. The, uh, the people came and eat bread the first day. They were eating, you know, multiplied the bread and the fishes and all that stuff. And they came back the next morning for for more food, right? Yeah. And he uh, he didn't give them food, and they were very upset. And they started to negotiate with the Lord, you know, like, "Come on, feed us." And he's like, "No, I'm not going to feed you. You don't even understand why you're here or why I'm here. You're here for a blessing. You're here because, uh, you know, I fed you yesterday." And the you you, you know I, I was I always say this that we look we always tune into the same radio station right called yeah. W W I F M I F M <laughs> what's in it for me right anytime that starts to come over you know something's in it for me we perk up man and so that's the reason why uh, that, yeah we talk about this all the time people always want to go to a church that fits them. What are they looking for? They're looking for the Y the W I F M. What's in it for me? If there's right. something in it for me, then I'll take it. So Jesus preached a very unpopular message, okay? You know, the, the best-selling books in the world are Your Best Life Now and, uh, you know, Christianity Today and all that stuff. So all the Bible studies, you know, the prayer of Jabez, that was all about bless me now, O Lord, you know. That wasn't the message Jesus really began to preach. He, 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 uh, he, hooked, he hooked them with the food, but then he started to preach to them a real message. And his real message wasn't about blessing. It was about sacrifice. <clears throat> and here's what he said. He said, they came back for bread. He says, I'm the bread of life. And they said, well, what do you mean you're the bread of life? Just feed us bread. And he said, if you, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have eternal life. And they were like, that is not what we came to hear, man. That's weird, man. That's weird. Yeah, they were like, this is crazy. And so uh, even as disciples were looking at him like, this is a hard saying. They said, <laughs> this is really difficult for us to understand. We don't get it. And so, and, and basically we know what he meant now. And the disciples understand what he meant afterwards. And he, what he was talking about was Calvary. He was talking about the cross. He was talking about the covenant. He was talking about sacrifice. And he's, he's saying, listen, this, this message isn't about the gospel message of salvation. It's not about blessing. It's about sacrifice in, in this world, in this life. So any, any, um, any um, teaching that focuses on your best life now and not your best life in eternity is going to leave out the message of sacrifice. It's going to leave out the message that Jesus, the hard sayings of Christ. Right. So here's what he asked his disciples. He says in John chapter six, verse 67, he says, uh, and when his disciples, he knew their heart and they were like freaking out because he talked about eating his flesh. Right. He says, Jesus says, will you go away also? Are you leaving too? Everybody Ask, left. Asking his disciples. Yeah, thousands of people left. They walked out of church. I always talk about that. You know, Jesus knows how to run off a crowd, right? So he had just the 12 left, and he looked at him. He says, are you leaving also? And here's what their response was. Simon Peter answered him and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. So they understood, even at that time, and they were just coming along, they were just still learning who he was and what it was all about. But even at that moment, they said, you know what? As hard as this saying gets, we're, we're still not going anywhere. Yeah. So they had obviously had a relationship with the Lord. Well, yeah, they've, they've seen the miracles. They've, yeah. Yeah. So no matter how weird it gets for them. Yeah. It's like, I know you got what it. Yeah, we're, it. we're sticking this out. And we understand that the message that you're talking about is about sacrifice. And if, we have time to go through all the, the whole Bible. But if you go through the whole New Testament, this, is what, this was the focus of the, uh, the New Testament church was sacrifice. Of course, they were under persecution and they were doing all those things. And they were, the disciples were like, come on, guys, you can stick this out you can go you can make this what we come against in this culture really in every culture 
Jesus, this was the culture when Jesus was then. It's the culture now because it's just human culture. And it's the I life. Uh, I always say this, that um, Steve Jobs and the Apple computers, they did a great job. Uh, wonderful. Uh, very smart. Marketing. Marketing, and, yeah. yeah. They came up with the iPhone, which I think that I, I looked it up one time, that I, the I stands for internet. No? I don't... Uh, the only reason I would think it doesn't is because the iPod did not have internet capabilities. And that no, was that's one of the true. First was that the I, first thing? I think so. All right. Anyway. I would have to look it up, but yeah. Whatever I meant, it turned out to mean I, like personal. It's just not personal, like the iPod, right? It right. was a personal, personal thing. thing. I remember before the iPod came out and the iTunes and the i whatever, we had to listen to the radio. Yeah. And it was whatever they wanted us to listen to. Right. Yeah. Whatever, whatever song they whatever wanted song. us to hear is what we were listening to. It was terrible, man. It was, uh, it, I mean, I ever, so anyway, so now with all of the personalization of this, like I always think about, um, what is it? Uh, Pandora, you know, you can, oh, yeah. you can, if you like the song, you can thumbs up or thumbs down, make thumbs your, up, make your own radio station, make your own radio W-I-F-M. station, right? Yeah. W I F M. Right. What's in it for Pandora. me? <laughs> so, so people want that. They want, they, people want, uh, they, they want what's in it for them. So they want the blessings, but they don't want obligation. This is how we, we, this is the danger of this is we take this culture and this mentality into our relationship with God. That means that we will, we'll take the blessings, but we don't want the obligation. That's what they said on the day when he was feeding them the bread. They said, we want the bread, but we don't want the obligation. We don't want the sacrifice. Right. Um, they want salvation. But they want choices. They want choices in their salvation. They, you know, some some people say, well, the scripture says that you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. They take that scripture and that's their I scripture. That's the, they take that and they go, well, it's up to me. And it really, that's not even what that scripture means. But they want, they want choices of doctrine and choices of worship, choices of music styles and choices of preaching. And that takes precedence over truth. That's the culture that Jesus was facing. That's the culture today. So here's the question. Is how, how did the disciples wrap their mind around this? They didn't leave. Right. They never left. He said, will you leave me now? They said, no. Even when he went to Calvary and he, he was crucified and they saw the sacrifice, he was resurrected from the dead. Then he told Peter, he says, Peter, you will also be killed for this. Yeah, so they're sitting there watching him be crucified yeah. and realizing themselves that this is one day going to happen to them. Yeah, God, Jesus told Peter. He said, uh, John's not going to be persecuted to death, but you are. Wow. Go preach this gospel. <laughs> so the question is, and, it, and it, how were they able to do that? How were they able to deny themselves and deny their, uh, their bread and to take the, the sacrifice instead. That's true patriotism yeah, to, right. to the cause. They were able to wrap their minds around this death to self, like like no one else, like in, in all of history until, until this time, right? I mean, we have people now, but here, we get to the point. What is the relevance of the cross for us today? And this is, and if we look at the relevance of the cross for the disciples, it can, we'll, uh, we'll connect the dots here in a minute. But here's what Paul said about this. Paul says, I am free from the body of sin and the bonds of Satan. Aren't you glad you're free? We're, we're free from that. However, he said, I'm not free to do whatever I want. I'm not free to live how I want to live. He says, but I am a servant to the kingdom. I'm a prisoner to the kingdom of God. I am free from the chains of sin, but I am in bonds to the gospel. I am a servant and a slave to his way of thinking. That's what Paul said. Second Timothy eight or second Timothy one and eight. He goes this, he tells Timothy this, he says, so do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join me in suffering for the gospel. That doesn't sound like your best life now. He's not writing a bestseller, a New York Times bestseller. No. He's talking about suffering. He says, because the suffering is the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own personal, his own purpose and his grace. This grace was given us 
in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it was now revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality and light through the gospel. This is the gospel. He says, and of this gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. That is, I am, uh, that is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed because I know in whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what he has entrusted to him for that day. He said, I am convinced that this is the way, the suffering, the sacrifice of my life and everything that I have given my I life away and I've taken the life of God. And that's a sacrifice to ourselves. So again, if you think about this, uh, he said, my mind is not free to think as I used to. If my mind's not mine anymore, he said, we have denounced ourselves and everything that I desire and everything that I want. We've, de- we've denounced all of that. So Jesus asked his disciples, he says, will you punch the dislike button? Or will you, or, and will you walk away? And they, so their answer was, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So believing in Jesus isn't enough. We have to love the word of God and we have to obey the full gospel. So then the question it's hard to take the, the doctrine of suffering. When you talk to people about suffering, it's hard to take. It's, and uh, it's hard to preach that. It's, it's, uh, it's hard to grow a crowd, just like Jesus didn't grow a big crowd by preaching suffering. In fact, he ran people off. But it, when you start talking about the cross and you start talking about what Jesus did for us, it, it, it connects all of this together, and I'm going to explain how. The question I keep going back to is why, how? did the disciples give their lives away? Totally. They, they sacrificed everything. Literally, they gave their lives up for this. All of them but one were killed, martyred by, for, for preaching the gospel. And here's what I'm going to say. It's because they all had a personal relationship with the suffering of Calvary. Every one of them. Take John, for example. John said this. He said in 1 John 1 and 1, this was after Calvary, uh, there was people coming out of the woodwork and they were saying that Jesus didn't actually come in the flesh, um, that he didn't actually suffer the death of the cross. You know, he, it was a display, but it really wasn't, you know, a fleshly thing. John said, no, 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 no. Here, here's what he said. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, we have looked upon him. Our hands have handled him, the word of life. That's what he said. You see, John had a personal experience with Calvary. No one else really, uh, except for Mary and those that were there, the the centurion soldiers, those that were there at the foot of the cross, literally. But John was there. And uh, I, I, I often say this, that John literally heard his name called from Calvary. Now, just think about that. Just think if you were there, I'm, I'm t- horrific, horrible, yeah. no words to describe it. The Passion of the Christ, Hollywood did a great job. They really did. People were horrified by that movie. Right. But still, there really is no way for them to put us there. Yeah. To, for us to see the, the terrible disfiguration, the, the, the nails, the, the immense pain, the cr- excruciating pain, literally. But John was there. He saw the blood. He saw the, the nails. He saw everything. He, Jesus, he, he spoke like seven phrases from the cross. You know, forgive them, Father. They don't know, know not what they do. Different things. And there's one thing that he said. He looked down at John. Eyes locked eyes. And he says, John, this is behold thy mother. This is Mary, my mom. He says, but now you guys take care of one another. But he, that was personal. John was never the same. Think about that, man. I can't even imagine what that would have been like to literally be there. But what I'm, what I'm, what I'm telling you, I, I read this uh, in, um, well, let's see, it was uh, uh, J.T. Pugh wrote a book called The Wisdom and the Power of the Cross. And I, I read that book uh, while I was studying to write this book. Um, did, have I promoted this book yet? Um, kind of. I yes. did? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. So anyway, by the book, it's, 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 this is the first chapter in the book, actually, about what Brother J.T. Pugh wrote. But he says the cross is just as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. 
And you think, well, how is that possible? So, you know, as we're moving into this Easter season, we're thinking about, you know, Easter and all that, but you've got to realize the cross is just as relevant today as it has always been. Even for John, Even it's for as, John. just as relevant for us as it was for John, because every one of us can hear our name called from Calvary. And I'm going to tell you something. When you hear your name called from Calvary, you will never be the same. You will be able to follow this sacrifice, hook, line, and sinker. You'll be able to give your eye life. You'll be able to give it all away. This is, this is the message the apostles were preaching. This is what Paul preached. This is what, because they all had a personal experience with the cross, even if they weren't there. And what, I, what I'm saying is this. I remember the day that I had a personal experience <clears throat> with the cross. You were there when we went to the church that first time. Yeah. I was, I, we, Dustin, you were, uh, I don't know, nine years old or something. Yeah. But uh, our like, huh? Uh, I was eight no, or yeah. nine. Yeah. No, I was, I was nine. Nine. I was okay. Nine. I just turned nine. So we, I, I was an atheist, didn't believe in God. We, I never even go to church. I wasn't a Christian guy at all. It was completely opposite. Um, but I was, uh, we wanted to see the, I wanted to see the inside of the building that was new built in town, the church. And uh, so their first service, September the 26th, 1999, Magnolia Apostolic Tabernacle, I went into their first service to see their new building. And God met me there. And of course, I, I didn't tell the story, but my, our lives, my my wife and I were just in terrible dis disarray. And uh, we, I mean, I was just, I was, life and the decisions that I had made in life had crushed me to powder. And I had no self-esteem left. I had uh, I had no. Uh, I'd look in the mirror and just be very disappointed in the person who I would uh, turned out to be. I was just I was a mess. And um, but when I sat down on that pew, I, I wasn't there to worship. I wasn't there to pray. I wasn't there to do anything. I was just there checking out the crown molding, you know. And God spoke to me, and he he said, "I forgive you." And I began to feel this lifting of guilt and shame off of my off of me, and uh, I was converted from atheism to a Christian that day. Uh, I never lifted my hands. I never, but uh, tears coming down my face because when God spoke to me, and He says, "I forgive you," I literally in my in spirits, not literally, but spiritually, I saw Him on the cross. I saw him on Calvary. I saw the blood. I saw the nails. I saw all of those things. And I, for, I, for that moment in, in that time at that, in the, the, that church service, um, I was at the foot of Calvary and God spoke my name. And I thought I am, first of all, I'm not worthy to receive this forgiveness because I know what it cost him to do that. And so but this is how every person, I'm going to say this, every person needs to have that experience with the cross. People who come to this, come to the Lord, and then we call it, we, we call them, if, when, they, when they fall away, we call it being backslid or backsliding. And I'll say this, that people who backslide, to me, I'm convinced that they've never heard their voice, their name called from Calvary. Because once you hear your name called from Calvary, once you have a personal experience with the cross, you will never be the same and you will never walk away. Because th think about it, the Lord will ask, will you too go away? But once you have been to Calvary, what will you say? You'll say the same thing the apostles said. They'll say, where else will we go? Yeah. For you hold the keys to eternal life. So this is the first part of our series. This is what the, the cross is relevant for us today. We all need to have an experience with the cross. And, and maybe you haven't had experience with the cross. Maybe we're talking to folks out there that haven't had this experience. Maybe you've just heard about it. Um, you've read about it. You've heard stories, watched movies, whatever. We're going to go through a series and we're going to talk about what does the cross mean for us? What did the nails mean? What did the crown of thorns mean? What does, what does all this mean? It means it, it, it's very personal for each one of us. So stay tuned. Next week, we'll, we'll bring back another podcast and uh, hope to see you here.